So uh, welcome back. We are looking forward to getting started with the next panel. Uh, this, is, uh, this is going to be an exciting panel where we are really going to dive deep into how to collect data sets and what opportunities exist for the wireless community. So to that extent, I'm going to request the, um, the panelists to please come in front of the stage. And uh, firstly, also thank you to uh, Ashu for willing to be the moderator for this panel. And uh, Ashu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks all for being here. Uh, great to be here. Um, so this, we have heard a lot about uh, what type of data sets we need um, and the relationship, uh, are the things we want to actually have in the data sets. This panel is people who are enabling data sets, people who are actually building platforms which hopefully will help provide data sets to many of the people who are interested in it. So the topic is at scale data collection through power platforms. So power is an NSF pro uh, funded project, platforms for advanced wireless research started four years ago now, and now all four platforms which are to be funded are funded, they are in action. So we have, I think, representation from all of them, if I am right. Um, so the questions which were uh, posed to us uh, were existing opportunities for data set generation and maybe some successful examples, early successful examples which are coming out. How can we lower the ba barrier for new and first time users? This has a topic which has come about quite often and really important part of uh, enabling uh, database research and then storing, curating, disseminating data sets and our data sets as a service, which is actually a nice uh, model which is emerging from many discussions happening in Power Project. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna request uh, my panelists to speak first and I'll speak last. And we've got to start with Magrath first uh, and then go in that order in the slide deck. Thank you, Asha. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I think they're loading your slides. They're not. Yeah, okay. you can get started. Yeah, okay, while they are, they are loading the slides, I can just get, I can, okay, yeah, they're here. Yeah, um, j just to start, th this goes like this. Okay, okay. Uh, quickly, I'm just going to go through this because I know I have only five minutes. Uh, uh, Aeropo is one of the, uh, the uh, four projects. It was awarded in 2019, and it has uh, five phases up to 2025. And quickly, if you can see, I, I'll go to the, to the other slide. Um, this one, I'm not going to talk through this, but I just want to show this, uh, and it's, it's most similar to many other four platforms. And this is, these are the data generators. This is where the data is coming from. And you can see the ones uh, in red, they are the ones that are now available. They can be used. Uh, it, it, uh, the platform became generally available last year in November. So, and you can see the, the other ones are on the way, most of them are going to be available um, from summer, I believe. We are now building other towers, and by the end of summer, they'll be available. But now going to the questions, I just, this is a very populated slide, but I just want to share specifically for airport how uh, the data set have been generated, and I just uh, divided that in, in the workflows that we have. And a very common workflow is the program it yourself. This is what we see a lot in the platform, like uh, you know, the experimenter will ask the environment and they will do the, the coding. And um, once they finish coding the experiment, we will take it to the field and help uh, fly it or maybe use the rover and generate the data that they want and bring it back to the platform. And probably at this point, yeah, because I, I received questions from several of you asking how uh, Airpo works, and I will take this opportunity probably to say it is, it is um, like three-stage experiment process. The first one, we have uh, the virtual environment where you researcher experimenter will use to, to do the coding for your experiment. And then the second stage is us back at airport, the, the pilot will take your experiment to the field and actually fly it, or probably ride the rover if you want to use the ground vehicle. 
And the third stage is for, the, for us to bring back the results to the virtual environment. So that, that's how uh, it goes. And for the first, this is, this, th th those are the three stages. Uh, the, first, the second workflow that we have experimented as a service, probably haven't seen it a lot with the experimenters. But, but um, this is for, for those busy researchers, busy experimenters, they, they know what they want to do, but they probably they don't have time to do it, or probably it's a long learning curve for the, for the uh, platform. So they will exp explain what they want to be done and we will do it for them and return uh, the results. The third um, workflow is experiment development as a service. And I was really uh, glad to see in the questions when it says uh, data set as a service. And this is one of the workflow that we, we can provide a data set as a service. It's like we, we develop the experiment for you and we give it back for you to continue the program with yourself um, kind of experiment. And this is also one of the workflow that can help lower the barrier for the newcomers because if, if the, the learning curve is that high, we can take you through that and okay yeah through this like the first one program with yourself you can see we have a data set published with uh i triple e data port we also have some experiment i don't know if it is very visible the the one at the the top top left this is another one of the uh, four projects the flynet also they did the experiment and they published the data on github last last week i think last week last two weeks we also did experiment with Helikite to just for, for spectrum monitoring, and we generated data. Uh, uh, when I'm going to talk a little bit more about data, we'll see. We also have a challenge with the size of the data. For example, for the Helikite, it was a, a lot. The IQ samples, this um, massive data that we, we couldn't even capture all of it. But apart from that, also we have, I'm not going to go through all this workflow, but I'll go the, with the common one. We have limited, uh, li the live limited access. This is mostly for exper experience experimenters. For example, one we have with Airpo is Ericsson, and it's direct access to the, um, to the bare metal uh, resources that they are with Airpo and uh, different resources, for example, we have the Ericsson, we also have Propsim, some of the team here I think are also using Propsim. This is uh, another example of the workflow that uh, can it is used to generate data with um, Airpo. We also have bring your own device. And for example, a, another, a good example is last month we had researchers from Finland, VTT Finland, and they collected um, data under the project uh, that is uh, jointly funded by NSF and, and Finland uh, government. They also collected a lot of data with RADA, but it's, it's yet to be published because they, they have to format it and things like that. So those are the common uh, workflows that generate data from uh, Airpo platform. So I wanted to share in this um, uh, few data set that we have. Um, for this one, actually it's related to the second question, but I'm not going to talk through all of this because of time. I'm going to focus on the onboarding OVO. And, and this answers the question on how to lower the barrier for newcomers. And we have discussed, I think Ashu said, this is, um, is also a topic that comes up uh, in several discussions because we have these all platform, four platforms and they have um, different ways of doing experiment and you know if you're coming to do experiment to that pl platform you have to go through a very long user manual i think if you have used Airpo, you have seen ours it's a lot of section and section of reading to be able to to do experiment right and so uh, what I'm, I'm saying here is that it, it's really important to make it easy to the users like with the de de details detailed the user manual but also very easy to follow and it will be a great idea to have recording. I think at Airpo we have started recording, uh, recording ourselves doing things in the platform and post them uh, online so users can, can see. It's easier to see a video than to read line by line of the user, user manual. But also, I think it's a great idea to have in the platform public project and public experiment that uh, people can come and play with and create things and destroy things. And so in order to, to be able to practice. And another point is to provide templates. 
So I, I know a number of platforms have uh, templates ready for, for face comments to, to use, and it, it's a great thing. It helps instead of uh, users creating their own um, experiment definition. Um, another another thing I think it's, it's great for uh, lowering the barrier is office hours. You know, some of you call it office hours. Uh, you know, user town halls and after hours parties, you just come and hang out with the uh, platform operators and we talk and we show you things, ask all kinds of uh, questions and we can work you through. We, with Arab, we haven't started official office hours yet, but we do a lot of email contacting um, and direct, like, you know, specific meeting with, with experimenters and, and uh, things like that. So all of that, I've talked about the um, experiment the, the, uh, as a service. I'm not going to go through all of those, but those are the points I, I had to for lowering the barrier. Okay, this one I'm going to go really um, fast. It's related to the to the third question. Ash, am I? Uh, am I uh, it's okay, I think it's important okay. to keep going, yeah. Okay, so this, this one is really related to data um, generation and sharing. Um, and what I wanted to really talk about is, first of all, showing the building block of uh, the data how we generate and, and the sharing, and also we'll talk now about the, like the challenge in all of this. First of all is who, and this first who is who generates the data. Is it the, the experimenter or the platform itself? And we have seen like in all the discussions is that the, the, it, it, it makes a difference with uh, who generates the data because if it's the, the platform, then we, we see a number of you uh, owners of the platform, you have control of the data you generate and how you share it and things like that. But we don't have control of the data that experimenters are generating. And there are challenges um, to that. But of course, the what is the, the raw data that we get from the platform, but also the metadata that uh, accompany the data itself. Most of us in this room know why it is important to share the data that we generate. Of course, because of reusing, replication, collaboration, but also we have the for compliance reasons, like you have um, entities like NSF and other behind us, the funders, the third party who want uh, you to publish your data, so you have to comply. Th those are some of the of the reasons, and and then the how. How can we uh, um, process this data and represent it in order to make it easier to share and, and to reuse? We also have the where uh, question is where to store it and how long to store it. And I have a second um, who, which is related to who really owns the data? Because you might be the generator of the data, but you are not the owner of the data. And that makes it makes a big difference on if you will share the data or not and how you will share it. So now what I want to spend time talking is the, the challenges in between all of these um, uh, blocks. The first one, and these challenges, some of them are specific to Aeroport, some of them probably are common to all uh, the platforms. But from the what to how to, to, sh to share the data, we have some issues and also maybe ideas. Yesterday we were talking a bit about SIGMF and we can see how we don't have standards. And the data and the metadata we generate, they are vastly different. And we cannot use the same um, code SIGMF to represent the data or any other standard. I know we have uh, HDF5 and all of that. And specifically for Aeroprof, it, it's the challenge we are having, probably we, we will solve it in the, in the um, near future, I hope. It's the mobility side. You know, the, I know uh, our researchers have this data that has um, the position, the orientation, the velocity, and all these other metadata, and it's not easier to represent using CGMF. I know yesterday we talked about, you know, customizing the, the core uh, basic CGMF to be able to represent that, and that's the way we are, we are following. But anyway, talking about probably we need uh, standardization, we need um, to customize these tools to fit uh, our needs and probably continue to work through that way. So that's one of the challenge we see there. But okay, wh when you go to how and where to share, we, we talked about the the how big the data is. We talked a lot about that yesterday. 
And we are asking ourselves the question, should we keep the data as long as necessary or uh, what should we do with the data? If we are collecting data but and we'll be collecting like 10, 20, 30 years to come and where are we going to, are we going to, to store it? Last week I attended MERIF uh, and this is, was um, a big debate of not only how long to keep it but which data should we keep and which one should we throw away? How, what, like where, where which criteria should we use to say like, okay, this data is not good, let's just throw it away. And this one is good, probably let's keep it as long as we can keep it. And someone gave an example of uh, the data that was used during COVID. Like it was data that was there like 30, 50 years ago that we didn't even think that we will need it. And we just came to need it 50 years after it was there. So should we keep the data that long? Those are the questions that we don't have answers either with the uh, IRCOM. And, and um, the issue of integrity, like the data that we will put in the storage today, will it be the same data that we'll, we'll find it 10 years to come? Maybe it will be changed and who will change it? Like, will, are we going to be able to know how it was changed and, and how it, it evolved over time? Those, those are the, the other questions that probably we'll hear answers in, in this forum. Okay, the other issue, uh, this is this is the last, Ashim, I'm finishing. <laughs> I, there's one more, so. <laughs> really, there's one more, no, I'm not going to talk about that. That one, no. So, um, yeah, th the issue on now, data sharing. Data sharing, as I said earlier, um, who really owns the data? Is it the generator of the data, the experimenter who is coming to the platform and do experiment? Or there is a third party behind, probably the funder, probably the employer, and if that's so, is, is the experimenter um, allowed to share the data and or is there any, any data sharing agreement that can be in between them and allow the data to be shared? These are the things that we have to look at and, and, and see. And, and fr I'm talking from the point of encouraging data sharing from the platform itself and also from the experimenters who are coming to the platform. And these are the things we can look at and, and, and and, and try to make sure that we make it easier for, for them to share the data. Another issue that was discussed a lot yesterday is about privacy because th that is one of the hindrances in sharing the data. So, and we are, um, are just asking is, is the data, first of all, is the data anonymous? If, if the data is, is that does not identify someone, it's easier to share it. But if we, it has uh, personal identifying information, can, can it be um, anonymized? If yes, then it, it, it's a process to follow and make sure that the data is anonymized and ca it, it can be shared. So instead of, you know, we saw that we have fear of sharing the data because we don't know what will come out of it. Like if we share the data, are we going to be sued because we it accidentally identify someone? So some of these questions we don't have answers yet, but what I'm, I'm, I'm advocating is that Let's start from the very basic, like the, the guidelines of these, some of the things I'm saying here is something that you can put in the guideline to follow and, and make it easier to, to share the data. But I know that we discussed about other sophisticated means that we can use to, to, to make sure that the data is, is easier and, and it's easier to, to share. Of course, I talked about size, so I'm not going to repeat about it. And Ashwa, is, I promised I'm not going <laughs> to talk about this. But it's mostly what I said. Oh, thank in the you very much. That's I great. Yeah. Let me just pass it to. Oh. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm Sneha Kumar Kasera from the University of Utah. I'm a professor in the School of Computing there. And it's, uh, it's my pleasure to participate on this panel. And I, I'm happy to talk to you about the Powder platform, which we think is, is very exciting and, and offers great opportunities for, for wireless research that, uh, it's, uh, that wasn't possible before. So let me start with a quick overview of the Powder platform. And uh, essentially, Powder is a, is a flexible city-scale research infrastructure. But when I say city-scale, it doesn't span uh, the Salt Lake City area. But it, it does span uh, 1,500 acres, uh, which is the University of Utah campus. 
and uh, and you know we had some plans early on uh, to extend to downtown but that that we are not doing right away and uh, and the so the so it is a, it's it spans a big area and it it provides uh, end to end uh, uh, software defined uh, you know everything is end to end and and software defined in the powder platform so you can program at the lowest layers and and at the upper layers of course and uh, it it provides software and hardware building blocks and uh, it it provides uh, different styles of experimental flows including uh, flows that would allow you to collect data and uh, and the you know it is remotely accessible you can have bring your own device and bring your own software you know you can do that with the powder platform and uh, it's part of it's it's one of the fcc innovation zones and uh, and, and so uh, you know, in this figure here, you can see that we have uh, different styles of endpoints. There are fixed endpoints which are located static endpoints. We have uh, we have uh, powder nodes on on shuttles, campus shuttles. That there are several such shuttles that move around on campus, and actually you can track those shuttles, uh, you know, online. And uh, and then we have uh, you know. Uh, uh, additionally, we have uh, created uh, backpack-style powder nodes that people can carry those around, and we have a few of those as well. And uh, of course, you can bring your own device, which which I already said. And and so this just shows uh, the picture of how you know uh, this the span of powder. And so the big picture here, the the one in pink and and green, that is the area where powder is deployed. That's the University of Utah campus. And the, the 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 smaller figure below actually is a live map. You can all see that you know uh, how powder is deployed, and and actually you can also see shuttle buses and things like that. So uh, as of May 2022, we have nine uh, base stations, uh, rooftop base stations. We have massive MIMO capability that is done in collaboration with uh, with the Renew folks at Rice, and Ashu is, is going to talk about that. I believe, and then we have uh, 10 fixed endpoints. Uh, we have mobile endpoints, uh, 20 plus mobile endpoints, and the portable endpoints that I talked to you about. Like these are the backpack style powder nodes that you can carry around. And we have uh, you know compute nodes associated with an optical uh, fiber uh, con connectivity uh, from the powder nodes uh, that you know build the front hall and back hall and and and. And we have uh, a lot of edge compute, and and uh, and then that leads to uh, uh, you know more uh, more cloud style compute uh, as well, and uh, and and then there is a specific area in powder that we call the dense deployment area where uh, you would uh, see that these nodes are placed close by. So if you want to do experiments, uh, you know around that and the fast handovers and things like that. Those are possible in the in the dense deployment areas, and and so let me talk about the RF data set generation on Powder and give you some quick examples. So we have been actually uh, periodically doing sp spectrum sweeps uh, at twelve sites on Powder, and uh, you know this goes back to August twenty twenty, and uh, we are doing a few scans every day. We we can we are able to sweep from eighty hertz to six gigahertz. And uh, we have collected uh, a lot of data, and uh, the total size right now is 16 gigabytes. But you know, so far, but it's still going. This is an ongoing thing, and some of the potential uses of this data are: you could, uh, you know, generally study spectrum occupancy. You could do, uh, you know, evolution of specific bands over time. You can study that, and then correlate with different uh, between sites. Uh, you know, because these powder uh, base stations are separated uh, over the campus, you could also correlate with real-world events like is there a football game someday, or, or there is you know um, uh, end of semester and things like that. So, so those you can uh, you can see that correlation in in your data, and we have uh, you know some other, some other examples include path loss data sets. Where we have six base stations and nine endpoints and and the total fifty four links, and and we monitor those and and then uh, you know the graphs here show you can you can plot these these types of graphs. Uh, another thing we did uh, this is more recently is uh, you know a data set set for signal strength estimation, 
And here we have a single rooftop node uh, in powder that is uh, transmitting a continuous wave signal uh, in the CBRS band and using a USRP X310. And, uh, and, and we are measuring the received signal strength across the campus as the buses, uh, you know, the shuttles move around. And uh, the blue or the purple represents actually low signals and the orange and red is, is, is the high signals. And, and you can see that actually we, we get a reasonable like, signal strength only in a smaller area and that's actually closer to the base station. And this is because we are not able to transmit at any at, at a at a reasonable uh, power level right now, uh, and so that's what you see. But but then you know you can use something like this, and uh, you know there are these uh, tools that are available. Like there is something called Tyrum. If you're I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but it's a you know it's a physics based tool that allows you to 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 uh, estimate you know uh, the signals strength. Uh, based on the geography, the, the ge geographical uh, nature of the of the uh, of the terrain and and things like that, and buildings, and it takes into account all of that and gives you a physics-based estimate of signal strength. So so now we can compare that with what we measure uh, in powder, and and then we we have opportunities to do you know uh, you know ML-based models that we can bring into into Tyrum, which currently does not use uh, ML-based models. It's, it's focused on, on physics-based models. So um, uh, moving forward, we have, this is uh, an example of something uh, very interesting that we, are, we did. So, and it just shows you the power of being able to transmit at a high power. And, and so we, we just used a family uh, radio service, uh, you know, transmitter that transmits at one watt. And, and look at how it has lightened up the whole campus, you know. So this is, the, the red again represents uh, high signal uh, strength and, and the blue represents low signal strength here. And, and you can see that the, as the buses move, we are able to collect, uh, you know, a very good data with, with uh, if we are able to transmit at a reasonable power level. And again, this, this type of data could be used for, for, the, for, for localization studies, for the understanding you know, different uh, 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 comparing different localization approaches as well as for uh, for improving path loss models, etc. And and we have also uh, been doing large scale cellular measurements on powder. So here you are not limited to just signal strength. Here we are able to capture resource blocks and how resource blocks, how many resource blocks are used, and and that information is available. Uh, through this uh, DCI data that that is uh, that you can actually snoop and and right right now we are using uh, two uh, tools to do that we have uh, Falcon which is a you know a, a publicly available uh, free software that you can use and then there is SRSUE also that we use uh, for collecting this data so uh, uh, you know uh, we have uh, for for helping users to uh, to to collect data on powder, we have a tool that we uh, built called Shout. Actually, it's a measurement framework that allows you to transmit and receive data across different powder nodes. And uh, we also have this uh, approach of, uh, you know, the, the workflow I, that I talked about in the first slide. Uh, here we have, uh, essentially, we provide what are called profiles. So these are, these are essentially like an experimental setup, a profile represents a setup. So you can, you don't have to build that yourself. You can, there are lots of profiles that we provide. You can just select one that works best for you and then actually run the experiment. So, and, and of course you can build your own profile too, but, but we have, you know, uh, simplified this for users who, who don't necessarily want to build their profile or who are in the process of learning first and then going and building their profiles. And, and we have some, uh, you know, uh, functionalities like you can, uh, we can offload the data when, even when you are not actually running the experiment. So, so let's say the data is collected, uh, you know, at a powder node and there is, there is some storage, persistent storage available at every node. And so we can, uh, you know, we can offload that data whenever uh, the, the, the network is available and, and then send, a, you know, that data in a tarball through email if, if it is not big, uh, you know. 
of course, uh, emails limit your how much we can send you. Uh, and and so with with respect to storing and curating, disseminating, this is uh, you know this is a, it's work in progress right now. And and some of the questions that have been brought up, like how do we actually organize this data, the data privacy issues, all of this, this is still work in progress for us as well. But there is powder derived data that's available. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are exploring different models for how to store the data. We have we've looked at this public uh, you know, repository that's available, open repository, Zenodo from Europe, and there are other options that we are looking at. But we, you know, we want to help all powder users. So if, you, you, if they want to collect data, we are, we are you know, happy to help them set up their experiments. Uh, we do hold uh, powder office hours uh, we we have uh, any support that you need. We are we are happy to provide that to you for for running your experiments for collecting data. So uh, that's all I have. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us to be in this panel and uh, discuss a very, very interesting, exciting project so called Error at Iowa State University. And so I'm Yung Guan, um, a professor in the Department of Electrical Computer Engineering. And um, the Error pro project is being, lead, being led by the PI, uh, Hongwei Zhang. And so uh, Daji and uh, Ha Hamad are leading the infrastructure working group, setting up the physical resources and in many sites that we're gonna talk about in the next few slides. And so Mai and I, we are co-leading the Airsoft, which is the, we are developing the software platforms and resources to help the experimental users to utilize this air test bed. And so we'd like to thank NSF, PPO, and Northeastern Tommaso to, to choose us as the, the youngest, the fourth uh, power platforms. And so different from uh, Sneehar, the powder, and Aeropole and this platform. So we started last year. Uh, this is the, the uh, close to the end of the first year of the project. And as I said, so we are the youngest, and so we certainly not as capable as you know, Powder yet. But we hope in the next few years we are able to do the same or even better uh, than the, the other path. But certainly when I said that, so it's not like so we are competing or anything like that. So we are collaborating. And so we are learning a lot from Powder Group, we have Aeropower Group and others and so on and so forth. And we are providing a comparable capability to help users and so on and so forth. So, so this is, we are, we are started last year and so this is still in the beginning of phase, the phase one of the projects. So I like to focus more on the capability, opportunity and collaborations. And so how we can uh, build a test by to be appropriate and to help the users, you know, this community, the, the, uh, the large network uh, com communities and so on. And so, so there was a reason to choose Iowa State uh, as the last and the fourth power platform because our focus, mainly focus on the agriculture and rural communities, which is not the focus of the other three test facts. That's kind of the unique things there. And so for rural communities like, so look at so Iowa, Iowa or Midwest or uh, any part in the country. So it's very different from the city environment because usually so in the city environment, we have a much better uh, wireless coverage you know, through the cellular service providers than others. But in rural areas, look at Iowa and Illinois and Nebraska, we know so there's a lot of rural cities and have a little or even no internet access. And so a lot of schools rely on very low bandwidth uh, network connectivities and a lot of farmers, a lot of farms have no connectivity at all. And that's kind of same things there. So in, in rural means we need to consider very special wireless channel conditions because of the, the range, the, the geographic range, because it goes along like maybe a few or maybe a tens or hundred kilometer range. And so it's very difficult to do the same experiment in the urban environment to evaluate the find appropriate technology to help the farmers help the rural community to grow because you see the big difference between the urban and, and rural communities 
we are seeing a lot of towns in Midwest, they are shrinking in terms of population, in terms of a lot of things. We hope error, you know, as a test bed, we are able to uh, generate or develop some solutions to help those rural communities. They can grow as fast as possible, at least not that like slower than most urban areas we are the population of communities they are seeing today. In central Iowa, we choose Ames and we choose a, a town like Oviso Ames called Boone and it's the birthplace of wife of President uh, Eisenhower. And so between Ames and Boone, there was a rolling skills and there's a lot of trees, high trees, and also uh, just like central Iowa, you're seeing uh, very similar to other Midwest states. And there's a lot of the, the crops, like corns and soybeans and many other agricultural crops. And then so look at so every year, like so from spring, the seeding seasons, and up to the fall and winter, the fall seasons, you're seeing so the height of the crops growing from like minimum to like something like two, two meter tall crops. And so, and also seeing the season now because of the snow, because of uh, thunderstorms and wind and all the natural conditions, they change the various channel conditions. And so this test by providing a very unique environment to do some experiments to evaluate, for example, a particular various technologies we are considering whether it's appropriate for rural, for agriculture, for many other purposes. And again, so we are not targeting the users, like many of the various users or various researchers. We are looking at more a much larger communities to work with John Deere, you know, the, the agriculture machine uh, industry, working with Collins Aerospace, which is the one of the, the major aerospace electronic industry in Iowa, headquartered in Iowa. And so we like to evaluate this kind of wireless technologies in many different forms and different uh, ways and to evaluate it's appropriate for that particular application scenarios. And so we are planning a few uh, sites and as a, as a site, so the most, the western part of the like bones and to the most east side of the, the system. So this about go a range like a one, 100 kilometers on the most east part of the the network we, have, we are touching, we are connecting to a, a Indian tribes and so Maskraki uh, uh, Indian crabs. So we are connect, so we are utilizing you know, rooftop um, uh, to our installations and also we look at the, the water towers and so we are connect, trying to connect a lot of smaller rural cities with the hundreds or even most likely the most less than 1,000 population and to connecting them together and try to help and try to enable some of the interesting applications we are using every day in the urban area without having any problem, but in the rural areas, we have a lot of issues and need to be solved and so on. So we are targeting like two uh, type of things, the arrow hall and the arrow run, and arrow hall providing a more long, longer distance uh, range services, connectivity services, the arrow run provide a higher, higher bandwidth and but it's a short, little bit shorter range of communications. And so this also we are we planning to use Cali, uh, 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 Halicat like uh, Aeropol was using. And then we are considering a lot of different kind of technologies from millimeter wave and, and to air optical, the optical networks because in the, in the uh, rural areas, a lot of times we are, we are able to uh, utilize the air optical connect, uh, communications because it, we can see a line of sight and there's a good qualities of communications possible and provide a higher bandwidth uh, communications. And so um, we also, as I said earlier, so we are not only work with the wireless researchers, we also work, try to work with the most, a much larger range of uh, vendors and also uh, researchers and uh, industry uh, collaborators and so on. And so we're looking at so the ag, uh, agriculture related like farms, livestock farms and um, um, uh, different kind of farms. And also we look into the ag equipment vendors like John Deere's and so on. So right now, so we have had a few workshops and so and trying to create and maintain a, a kind of community around error projects. So it was so successful. And so, in, you know, Iowa is a special way. So we, you were, so we, we, we hear a lot of news about like whenever, uh, every four years when we have a presidential elections, we seeing candidates visiting Iowa State University in Iowa, you know, within the small towns in Iowa. But other than that, have you heard of any news or 
and the things changing or happening in Iowa, very few, right? There's kind of things ongoing here, but you know, certainly so the ag um, the industry, so like John Deere played a very, very important role in this community, in this area, not only for Iowa, but overall in Midwest and many other agriculture state, uh, air part of the, the state, even in Texas and other, like uh, Utah and so on and so forth. So, and also we are, uh, we have revisited a lot of uh, small cities, rural cities. Uh, I use city, but actually it's a small town and even some a village. And we talk to them and understand their needs in terms of like internet activities, uh, connectivities, and so on and so forth. And so in terms of measurement data, so uh, I'm one of the, the, the security faculty on the error team. And so I, I co-lead the error soft uh, um, the soft, uh, software working group. And so one of the things we have to deal with is the privacy issues in terms of when we collect data, we share data with others, that's kind of things uh, we can contribute together as a community like Kashik, uh, uh, how we talked uh, yesterday. So we have a very interesting discussions about privacy issues and not only privacy, but also security. And so there's a lot of issues involved. And so we have to deal with those issues. And so we were, t uh, so one of the things we do uh, in, a, uh, in an error project, so we are trying to um, build not only a monitoring capabilities, so like for example, we are saying so error measurement, and also we try to build the capability for the users, the experimenters, they are able to collect data themselves, they can manage data themselves, they can decide, decide a way to release and share data. Yeah, uh, the, the next couple of slides. And then so, we try to build like same, same as uh, powder platforms. We, we try to make everything programmable, means that we can change and, and the parameters and so on and so forth. And so this table summarize a lot of kind of capabilities the experimenter, the user have has control over those devices, those resources. And also we are working on the wireless virtualizations allow user to utilize the same wireless resources in an appropriate way. And that thing's ongoing there. And so one of the very unique things I'm leading is a wireless guard, is we are trying to build a capability to be able to monitor the spectrum usage and in to determine whether it's appropriate to share a spectrum between among uh, users, for example, similar like the cognitive radio network, they have primary users and secondary users. When they use the, 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 the band, the spectrum, we have to be careful, otherwise it may cause interference with the other users in the same band and so on. So we utilize, um, so the, the key site, Omni uh, antenna and arc sensors, we also utilize the key site spectrum analyzer. And so this platform we already done, we already received those, uh, those devices. And so we are trying to put, we are putting together. And so we have done some experiments in the, in the lab uh, in the lab, and so we are planning a few sites and to allow us to do a monitoring of the spectrum usage of collecting the IQ sample data, and certainly so as we said uh, yesterday, so we can share those data in an appropriate way by considering the privacy and other issues. And the last one, so we, you know, as I said, so error is not only for various researchers, but also for the community, a large communities of many different type of users, rural cities and schools, and industry and so on. So we certainly, so we try to build this community and so we call for participants. And so we set up a online forums, webinars, AirFest, a lot of things, activities being planned and being, it's going to push forward this su summer and on. And so there's a lot of things ongoing for around Air. But certainly so, you know, as, as Potter and AirPod, you know, we certainly we work as a group. We are not taking individual project teams. We are working together and try to provide a capability for the country to do meaningful, useful research. And thank you very much. Of course, you how much time do we have? Five minutes. None of us take five minutes. So I'll start talking as we load the slides. Um, so um, I wanted to actually kind of remind us why we do research. Uh, I thought this would be a good place for us to remember. Um, that there is a scientific research method, which is well known, well established, 
centuries old. And so as part of the scientific research method, data is a step in there. And, and then generally we start with the hypothesis we want to prove, disprove, and then uh, only relevant data for that experiment makes sense, right? And not all questions actually require an experiment. So there are, you know, wireless is actually one of the areas where theory is very powerful. And many companies actually read information theory papers. Um, so we shouldn't actually go for an experiment till the question cannot be answered. And so doing an experiment is quite a bit of work. As you probably noticed, these platforms are very powerful, but also fairly complex. So I want, there was a question on whether there are successful examples. I don't think any of them have really come out from the, what we have done so far, but there's one from recent years I wanted to relay um, from just a personal experience. Um, so 2010, we demonstrated in-band full duplex. Uh, it was, timing was perfect because 5G was coming around, Massive MIMO was part of it. And Massive MIMO is really nice only in TDD. FTD Massive MIMO is still an open, kind of open problem. Um, turns out all the methods we had developed and other people had developed required changes to analog hardware. They were very difficult to scale to Massive MIMO. It's just analog doesn't scale very nicely. Um, so we had, hypotheses in the group, hey, can we, if you have lots of degrees of freedom in your uh, massive MIMO system, can I just build an all digital full duplex system? Okay, um, so how did we go about doing it? Um, we actually built a massive MIMO platform, actually, uh, built out of warp radios. This is how it looked like. We borrowed some arrays from NASA, um, had 18 warp nodes, a bunch of mobile nodes. We built a whole new measurement system just for this one experiment. Um, and then went to NASA, used their inner quake chamber, outdoor facility, indoor facilities. Eventually wrote two papers uh, using the same data set, which showed that actually you can get reasonably good performance if you just sacrifice some degrees of freedom to just cancel self-interference. And um, that was great. And in fact, fast forward, I would call it a success because in 2020, Qualcomm released a product which uses the same idea, essentially. Um, they actually use a full duplex massive MIMO base station demonstrator, which what they have is something called a uh, slightly different version of full duplex, but I would say that was for us a great ex uh, thing. We had a hypothesis, we built an experiment. It wasn't easy, but it was the right way of, only way of approaching the problem. Um, and we actually, I, in this case, I can actually relate it to something which was you know, now in production of sorts. Now it's good for us, not for the community. Uh, we got it done, we wrote some papers, some students got PhDs, um, but it's a private unrepeatable experiments, um, is limited measurement scenario, which I call convenience samples, whatever your building looks like is basically what uh, your convenience samples are. Is It's actually in terms of scientific research really not meet up the standard because the code we use for data collection can be open, but it's useless. Nobody can actually do, put it on a hardware and do anything with it. Um, and the, our documentation doesn't really capture full context, right? If you think of an experiment which follows a code, code is a mathematically, it's a technically a program, right? And it's essentially you, it's a, it's a proof of sort. We cannot actually check for any of our papers. And nobody really knows why we made certain choices. We made some choices, the students called, this was hard, this was easy, they made some choices. Nobody really knows. So I think it's not really good, in my opinion, for the community, great for people who can actually build these things in their labs. So what really are, actually, I think what you're finding is in this power program, there is an opportunity with shared test beds for certain types of research. And I think that's really the, the big difference from way we have done research before to way we can do now. Um, and we've already heard uh, on the, the platforms. And I want to actually st stop with one thought experiment, which I think I hope everybody thinks about. Uh, maybe we have time to discuss over lunch. Um, so before that, I want to talk about the renew part of it, uh, which in the power to renew. Our role is to uh, build the massive MIMO base station, especially the software stack. Um, and that's, those are now, as, as you heard from Sneha, deployed. They were originally deployed in, in a quick chamber uh, for a while, and there was a sandbox which we used for many things. They actually got used for a while by several teams. They are now retired. Um, now we are outdoors. The plan is to deploy three base stations there. 
Um, and these are built by Skylark, so they are base station class. That means they are, they are the similar things. They're actually selling as a product to other customers. And I think Sneha actually already had this map. What we have built are these two massive MIMO programming frameworks. The, left, the Agora is a real-time framework, um, which is a fully software programmed massive MIMO physical layer. Uh, it's really nicely scalable. So when we started out, that was our open question. So we've essentially in first three years addressed that, that we can build it all in software. Um, and then we have a, what is called Renew Lab, which is just a non-real-time uh, processing standard. Now, uh, I will let all of you, if you look at online for this, but the key opportunity is, as I pointed out, we can go from these problems and hopefully we can address some of them. I don't know whether we can address all of them, but we are making good progress. They are now shared repeatable, at least statistically repeatable experiments. We have diverse deployments. Uh, if Skylark hardware is also deployed in Aura, we actually get yet another scenarios for the same hardware. Hardware and code can now be very easily shared. Uh, you know, uh, that's I think the big, issue, big, big advantage from all platforms. And the full context can be for the first time really documented and shared, which is I think is really missing from most experimental work. Now, what's the real challenge? I think we have discussed a lot about that. We will have data sets, we will share. And uh, there is actually a whole set of uh, discussions which happen, which is on use, reuse challenge, right? So if you think about, I've uh, taken that circle and I've kind of unrolled it. Um, you have something you want to do. You have an experiment design. You implement something. This could be, by the way, it doesn't have to be wireless. Could be in physics, chemistry, biology. It's the same process flows. Then you collect the data, do analyze conclusions, write a paper, and so on and so forth, right? Now, what you want to do is uh, you have new project A, and you want to short circuit some of it. You don't want to do the experiment design and implementation. You want to use the data set. The, generally, the way it works is one problem, one data set, which is how, because it's a problem-specific question you're asking. You have a hypothesis. There is a right way of doing it. But one can ask, when can project A reuse the data set generated for project O? So there is actually a work on this stuff, which is called a test trial algorithm. You do a thought experiment first. You say, I would project a, team A designs their experiment assuming they have to implement all of it. That means there is no luxury of using anything. And if you get lucky that the data you needed is same or a subset of data used by project O, then you are in good shape. You can reuse is feasible. If it is not, you need to collect new data. There is no way you can actually use it. Um, and actually, this is the tricky part. It actually turns out this actually to determine whether something is a subset is the hard problem actually in most of the cases because you need a significant knowledge of project O and generally the way documentation and awareness or other things work, we actually, the community doesn't know how to do this well. And in fact, uh, if you look in causal inference literature, um, data set transportability, especially in clinical utilities is, uh, is very important. Um, there is a math to understand. Uh, if you look at Pearl Baron Bond transportability theorem, which I tried discussing, if you have the same problem but different population, but now we have a, a potentially need new math for understanding. If you have different problems but same data set, when can we actually reuse them, right? So, so I think there is something for us to be aware of um, and uh, hopefully discuss. So I'll stop here. I hammered through my slides as quickly as possible. Uh, hopefully we have a little bit of time so, uh, uh, for audience to ask questions, because we all know each other, by the way, so <laughs> and what each of us is doing. So it's all, all of you to ask questions to us. So I have a question. Uh, one thing, it was really prompted by uh, your, your slide just for now. You said that the, the anechoic chamber version of was retired. And so that kind of prompted a thought, why? And the reason I'm asking the why is one thing that we think about again from the scientific perspective and you know is experiments should change one thing at a time right right and the least you know you always want to look at the what little thing changed and how does how does that affect anything and one of the things that you notice across these different platforms is that they are quite different and there aren't like minimal changeable steps that allow you to connect one to another and what is that is that something we're missing in terms of the platform from a scientific integrity point of view of small amounts of deltas to understand what things are actually important? Um, and just, yeah, sort of just thoughts of the panel on, on this kind of question. Uh. So 
maybe I, I will just answer because there was a logistical reason why it was retired because it was borrowed space and uh, inner quake chambers are are hard and they're few so they you know reuse is required so if you put something like that there forever then nobody else can reuse it so that was the main reason um, and in the beginning it made sense for us to be there because it was the most controlled environment for us to sandbox things and test it out now to your point that's a really important question experiments to change things but if an experiment i would say requires that then perhaps these test beds are not the right approach to do it so the the thing is actually that simply um, the it problem every test bed faces on day one of their birth they have no idea what it will be used for so if you tell me i don't know what you'll use it for now design it for anything i could think of that's an impossible problem and so in the end, based on all the other reality constraints, you, you make choices and you say, okay, I'm going, this is what I think are an interesting set of problems and hence I will enable those at least. And then I hope I have enough flexibility in this that I can enable more over time, knowing very well that some of them will be out of bounds. Um, so, so I think the, if I were to rank order how, what goes in people who design this, Feasibility is, largest feasibility is what goes into the mind first. That if I can enable largest number of experiments. Once you can say I have the largest number of experiments I can enable, which I can see, because I don't know the full space of it, then I'll say usability is my next one. And after you've done those, then you say maybe easy is the last one actually. <laughs> Everybody wants it easy, but that's the last thing we want to think about. And you, it will be not somebody want people want to hear from the audience, and my colleagues may dis differ. But the first two things are really important. If you don't enable large feasible space, and make it reasonable, usable. In this case, as Magda said, with a lot of hand holding, office hours, stuff like that, we make it feasible. But then once a large enough community develops, which wants to use the platform over and over again, specifically, then the ease can be developed after that. Uh, for, for like for teaching purposes and other purposes so so that's basically I think what goes on but I don't think there is a way to enable every experiment which we haven't seen yet maybe I think you have something to say no oh I thought maybe you are about to say something okay <laughs> all right does anybody want to add anything I'm sorry I took over that question well you, yeah. you did a good job <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe I can add uh, one point um, even though we are the youngest test bed right now, and but we have thought about a lot of issues you mentioned. For example, you said so you know for any experiments, and if the user or experiments uh, turns, they want to change one parameter at a time, and mm -hmm. and so they get more meaningful uh, results, and also being explainable and justifiable, and so on and so forth. So in error test bed. And so, I, I, as I said, so I, I co-lead the, the software platform, uh, the, the software working group efforts. And so we try to build a container-based uh, technologies, allow the user to adjust their parameters for the experiments. And in any way they like, so they change one parameter, they change two parameters at a time, but suddenly they cannot change like a few parameters, you know, at the same time. Otherwise, it becomes very, really difficult to understand and explain and so on. But certainly for, for, for doing that, and there are any kind of issues, for example, you know, they've been changed the, 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 the frequency band allocated for them to do, to experiment with. But, you know, it's not a lot. For example, if they, they continue, they change the parameter to, to change another band, they, they may cause the interference to another users, another set of experiments. So for that, so that's why I, 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 I use has a slide about, you know, wireless guard. And we do a monitor, active monitoring, and try to see whether there's any kind of wireless you know, policy or usage of this test band or wireless resources and so on. So that part, so if anything happened, you know, we have to take action to stop it because the error, errors, the software platform has that capability to stop the experiment if something goes abnormally or some maliciously and so on and so forth. But certainly we try to keep or give the, the experimental users a powerful capability to do something they like. And so, for example, adjusting our parameters and so on. But I, I think so, Snehar and Airport, they, they, they have thought about or even have a capability for the similar uh, sense. But yeah, I cannot talk, talk on behalf of them, but I just give you kind of ideas now. We do have thought, of, do have to think about those issues and so on. Thank you. That's a good question. Thank you.
thank you. Um, you know, just in the interest of time, I just want to let you guys know that these four individuals are here all the break, okay? So you, you must seek them out and ask them more probing, pressing questions, um, especially the question on how does data sets as a service build into the, into the plan, right? Are there examples? How do I get a quote? How do I reach out? How do I yeah, budget for these things in other proposals? So these are important questions that I'm sure many of us have and the community will have. So, uh, so please reach out to them uh, you know, and, and, and get all the information you can about how to use this incredible resource that the NSF has invested in, the power platforms for your research, for collecting data sets. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank the panel for providing these insights and thanks to our moderator for really getting the, uh, the, the discussion going. So thank you again.